a big hole. <clears throat> Welcome, Janet. How you doing tonight? Yes, I'm back with a great study. Hopefully a great study. Hi, Virginia. Good evening. I can never quite get the backdrop frame right. Like one end is always small enough to where um, a bit of my room shows. So let me know, is there anything showing right now? Cause my screen zooms in more than yours. And then uh, don't mind this hole right here. I don't know how it got there. <clears throat> Hopefully I got the frame right this time. It's hard to tell. I just started the study. I will start uh, for around 7.04. Boy, do I got a topic tonight. It's probably one of the most important studies I could ever do because it's, <laughs> yeah, history repeating itself again. I know, happens almost every time. Um, it's one of the most, it's, it is the most central thing to Christianity. It's, you can't, by definition, you can't even be a Christian without believing in the subject I'm talking about tonight. And we'll cover that uh, in the later in the, in the study. Hey, Lorena. Nice to see you here. I do have, um, it's scary for me to say this, and I know it's scary for you all to hear this, but I do have a lot of notes. I'm going to try to speed through it as fast as I can, and but as uh, precise as I can as well. I just have a lot of notes, pretty much, because there's a lot of evidence that I wrote down. A couple more minutes. All right, time to get started. So tonight's subject, I titled it The Resurrection, Way Too Embarrassing to Be False. Now I base this off of a principle that historians use to research historical events. And um, Vody Bakum, Dr. Vody Bakum makes a pretty bold yet true statement that <laughs> dogs barking that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most well attested fact in history you could go there I go again excuse me you could, I don't know what he's doing out there he's probably barking at his food like he always does um, you can go to any historical university or people scholars who study history or professors and ask them is there any fraction of evidence that attests to other ancient events that is more in comparison to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the evidence that is there? Now, before I start with the facts, it's important to note how crucial the resurrection is. Some people um, may even reject or they may even say that the resurrection is not necessary, that Christianity would do just fine without the resurrection and nothing could be farther from the truth and we'll see that in Paul's letter to the Corinthians so instead of approaching um, while taking in the authority of the scriptures maybe let's approach them in a more of a historical way as ancient Greek documents um, collected to be studied and examined so for my first to start off in my first verses We'll go to 1 Corinthians 15, a very renowned and a very popular and a very uh, pivotal, vital uh, section 
of First Corinthians. Notice there was uh, skepticism in the Church of Corinth about the resurrection, which causes Paul to emit this 15th chapter. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have also received, and wherein ye stand. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So I want to point, I want to point this out here. He delivered to us what he received. And he says, this is of first importance, that this isn't mine. This was handed down from the credo tradition by their early witness accounts. Many people would like to strip Paul's um, credentials and writings here and say that Paul actually was the one that made Jesus divine, that was the one that made Jesus to be God, was the one that said he resurrected and started the whole myth. But, excuse me, when we had this credo point, there's a few uh, reasons why it did not come from him, why we can see that Paul did not start this on his own. First of all, he the, the languages here, the words used here are not Pauline descriptive words. They are not Paul's uh, nature and, what, and the way he, that he writes. They are not uh, akin to his other writings. For example, he never uses, uh, what was the phrase here? I believe it was, um, where is it at here? Okay, uh, when he mentions buried and that he rose again on the third day, Paul doesn't mention that again in accordance with the scriptures. Let me just uh, read the rest of it first. <laughs> for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. This is one of the few, the very few times that Paul mentions the burial and the third day resurrection. And that he was seen of Peter, Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and that, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one, as of one born out of due time. Another thing that we could um, uh, take note here is that when Paul writes this traditional creed, this traditional creed goes back to within the first five years of Jesus' resurrection to the accounts and eyewitness testimony that was given then so early. I mean, anyone who claims that's not early wouldn't know anything about how historical documents are operated operate because there are so many other documents that we trust as a, as a society that are so much later like thousands of years later before the original event or after the original event I mean so that's another evidence this goes back to Galatians and also Acts pre-Pauline is what I'm talking about so um, point number one the principle of embarrassment is a, a strategy, a technique that historians use to establish historic events that actually happened. Meaning if there's a point in the in the story or the event where the authors are embarrassed or the the uh, the activities within the writings are embarrassed, it's much more like much more likely that the evidence is true and not made up and not false because of course we all know in historical evidence you wouldn't write anything to make yourself look terrible and that's what we'll see here they use this all the time with proving and establishing historical facts we'll go from the story of before the crucifixion we'll go to during and after the resurrection and we'll also talk about the apostles a lot as well so a vast you would be surprised to see how many historians and new testament scholars accept the facts that i'll present here today that they widely study these events and occurrences and evidences in the documents and accept these facts now fact number one the early church had the accusation to the Jewish Sanhedrin 
because they were the ones that essentially engineered a murder of Jesus. Now, it is believed and accepted by the majority of these scholars that this burial site, Jesus' burial, was by a man named of Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph from, Ar from Arimathea. And the reason why this is important is because Jesus' burial site was known to Jews and Gentiles alike. Therefore, any who claim he was resurrected could not be could, could not get far in the face of a tomb that contained his corpse. Now, it is much more unlikely, it is vastly unlikely, that the early Christian church would invent a character, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a part of the council that sentenced Jesus to death, which only amplifies and enhances the embarrassment that as the disciples made absolutely no effort to bury their leader, a member of the council that sentenced him to death was the one to give him a proper burial. So the disciples, the disciples scattered. I mean, they abandoned Jesus, and we'll cover that more in a moment. And fact number two, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his woman followers on the third day when he resurrected. Now, the reason why this would be qualified as embarrassing is because in first century Israel, as I've said in probably previous videos, it was better for there to be no testimony at all than to have the woman's testimony. It was considered to be so unreliable to the point where it wouldn't even be adhered to in a, in a court of law or to be admitted into that court of law. Now, embarrassing, yes, but we told the story. They just told the truth. It may have been embarrassing, but they told the truth which is another reason, another fact that make it much more likely, a, a lot more likely, severely more likely that this uh, testimony that the women were the chief witnesses to the resurrection happened and actually uh, came to pass. Now the disciples ran. We'll talk about more of the dim-witted disciples. They ran in cowardice from the terror that they felt when Jesus was being persecuted, mocked, uh, beaten, and on his way to be crucified. And who stayed? The women and John. The women were the one that stayed by Jesus' side. Now, who wrote this? Men. Now, what man would pen and record and document as fiction that the women were the one to be brave and stand by Jesus' side while we were the ones that ran and hid from the terror and the faithlessness that they had in the circumstances. Now, you could probably see that the embarrassment and the sheer uh, weight of the evidence that causes the disciples, the apostles to look pretty bad I mean it just shows that the truth is being told that it's not, not sugar coated I mean if it were me and I was trying to make up a religion about glory and about um, the leader of our religion of course I would pin that the testimony of the man was the one that was chief because if it was the woman's it just makes it it just made it so much more unreliable but the reason it's more likely the truth is because that actually did happen. Fact number three. The apostles described themselves as stupid. The apostles described themselves as stupid. When they pen, for example, in Mark 9.32, what we'll go to right now. Mark 9.32. Or Mark uh, 931. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, Jesus speaking, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Now look at the very next verse. 
and it shows the embarrassment of the circumstances that the apostles partook in. But they understood not the saying and were afraid to ask him. Jesus said, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to rise on the third day, the third day there's no need to be scared. <laughs> what is he talking about? They literally were too afraid to ask him and to verify such a simple saying. That pretty airheaded, if you ask me, a point of embarrassment, if you ask the majority of uh, New Testament scholars as well. You go to Luke 18.34, uh, John 12.16, the apostles on several occasions did not understand what Jesus was saying over and over again. Number, uh, well, point number two about fact number three. They fall asleep not once but twice in Jesus' uh, crucial hour of need to the, to, the, uh, to the moments and the hours where he was being led up to be crucified. They fell asleep on him twice despite him inquiring of them multiple times to pray with him. Jesus went back to the Garden of uh, Geth, Geth, that's easy for me to say, Gethsemane, three times to pray. Now, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, to also see a point about this. And notice, I'm just pulling and extracting uh, examples to so much embarrassment to the author's of these New Testament documents and to this is actually I'm not making this up this is an actual strategy that historians use in establishing historical facts so uh, Matthew 16 23 looking the wrong way there now here's one that I mean, I myself would find myself embarrassed to write. Then, but, okay, let me read verse 22, actually. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Excuse me. But he turned, Jesus turned, and said to Peter, Jesus said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be excuse me, that, but those that be of men. Peter is the only one in the Gospels that Jesus refers to as Satan. <laughs> I mean, I, you can imagine the, the authorship of Matthew. Matthew saying to Peter, Hey, Peter, I'm going to have Jesus call you Satan. What do you think? Embarrassment makes it much more likely that this is the truth. Now, another point. Apostles, stupid and dim-witted. Uh, several occasions of embarrassment throughout the New Testament documents. Paul rebukes Peter as a hypocrite. You know what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14? He says that he went to Peter straight to his face. Literally, he says, I went to his face and told him dead and told him dead in his face that he was wrong about a subject that he was, or about an activity he was doing. He called them a hypocrite. For leaving the Jews, I mean, um, he he dined with the non-Jews, and then when the Jews came in, he left the Jews in fear that they would despite the non-Jews. And then he calls him a hypocrite because of that. Now, when you have a religion, uh, a fanatical fiction, fairy tale religion that you're trying to compose, you don't have these type of discrepancies. I mean, one example uh, in the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith doesn't give points of embarrassment. He gives points that amplify himself. For instance, he says that not Jesus, not Christ himself did the things that I did, being discovering the, um, the so-called golden plates, I think it is, of Mormon that create the Book of Mormon. They are cowards, is my next uh, line. They are cowards. The apostles are cowards. All of them ran, except for John. All of them ran and hid themselves. And in the time where they should have been there the most, they all, they're saying that we ran. We ran at the cross. We ran at the persecution 
persecution. We ran at the mockery. We ran at the stones. We didn't understand what he was saying some of the time. We had discrepancies within each other. We would rebuke each other. Jesus called me Satan. I mean, all of these just add up to that strategy, to that historical technique. Where do you find embarrassment in establishing this historical fact? I wrote this down. A, a fantasy of glory, morals, and religion does not want to seem faulty, weak, or the creators as stupid. I mean, if you look at the evidence for Christianity, the Bible, the resurrection, there's not another so-called holy book that comes close to the attributes it has. Having all of these elements combined to undergird the truth that is within these texts. Fact number four. Most of the New Testament documents are about problems. If you look at 1 Corinthians, what's the problem there? Division, sexual immorality. What's the problem in 2 Corinthians? They don't believe Paul's an apostle. What's the problem in Galatians? Legalism. What does Paul do? Writes them a letter. 1 Corinthians writes them a letter. 2 Corinthians writes them a letter. Colossians, there's all sorts of heresies. And you know what's crazy too? And Dr. Frank Turk points this out. All of these problems we see today and that is why this book is still relevant all of these problems division sexual morality they don't believe in the authority of apostle of the apostles nor in the authority of Jesus in the first place legalism uh, multiple heresies uh, several thousands hundreds of heresies out in the world today fact number five the character of Jesus is much less likely to be fictional, to be fake, to be a mock-up because of the embarrassing details pointed towards him. Now, what I mean by that is he's considered out of his mind by his own family. That's Mark 3, 21 and 31. He's deserted by his followers. So first of all, he's considered out of his mind by his own family, and he's deserted by his followers in John 3, 6, 6, 6. Well, that kind of sounded weird. John chapter 6, verse 66. That's how she said. <laughs> he's not believed by his own brothers. That's John 7, 5. And he's thought to be a deceiver. That's John 7, 12. There's more to it, too. He enrages and to the point where the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Jews want to pick up stones and kill him. He enrages them to the point where they want him crucified. And uh, many people would like to say that Jesus never claimed to be God. But, I mean, I can give so many scriptures, boom, 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 all throughout the New Testament documents to where he indeed does claim to be God. And I would ask, um, for example, Muslims don't believe in the Trinity at all. They rebuke the Trinity with everything they got. But I would ask them, why was he killed then? Why was he crucified? Why was he considered a blasphemer? Because he said, love thee as thy neighbor, or love your neighbor as thyself. Kill him. No, he claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the God of Israel. He claimed to be the I am. In John chapter 8, they ask him, you're not even 50 years old yet, and you said you've seen Abraham? And then Jesus responds by saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. What does I am mean? The self-existent, the self-sustaining one. All the way to Exodus 3.14. If you make up... Oh, there's a few more points I have, actually. I skipped a couple. He's called a madman. He's a called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute. And he dies the heinous, humiliating, crippling death of a criminal. And it was thought by the Jews that whoever hangs on that tree was under the curse of God. If you're going to make up a religion about the glory of a Messiah for the Jews, you don't hang him on a tree. Because it was thought that he was under God's curse for his blasphemy, if it wasn't that case. This is pretty much the culmination of so many details about what I... Uh, for lack of a better term, embarrassment to the apostles, to the entire 
uh, circumstance that they had in the biblical days. Now, there's theories. There's theories that try to debunk. There's theories that try to uh, forfeit, discredit, undermine the resurrection. And I'll get to why I think there is theories in a minute. But theory number, let's just deal with these theories. Theory number one, the disciples stole the body while the Roman guards were, while the Roman guards were sleeping. That's one of the theories. Now, the reason why this one, I, I have them listed on my notes as dumb theories. And I, I just list them all. The reason why this is a dumb theory is because punishment for a Roman guard, first of all, was what? Off with his head. Now, the apostles would have to make sure that they were able to move that giant stone, first of all, I mean, not first of all, second of all, that took several men and get Jesus out of there and steal the body while the Roman guards were still sleeping. And also, how do you know what happened if you're asleep? Have people ever thought about that? How would you know what happened if you were asleep? And now, and also the point where this comes into credence to our position is that the first response of the Jews was itself vindication and confirmation that the tomb was found empty. So they now had to make up an explanation to why the tomb was found empty. Now, theory number two, the swoon theory. Jesus didn't die. He swooned. He just passed out. Now, there are a few um, dissective problems with this, and I have them all listed on my notes. So, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. I said that right. Gethsemane, and he sweats blood. It happens rarely, but it does occur. And when that does occur, Jesus would have been suffering from low, pretty low uh, blood pressure. Then he was severely beaten, I mean, marred beyond any man, to the skin was flesh ripped off of his flesh. Literally to the bone. He marched, he had to march for miles in this condition. Barely, I mean, barely, he could, he actually couldn't even carry his own cross. They had to has, ask someone to help him carry his cross up the hill. He marched, walked for miles in this condition. He's nailed. I mean, nailed. I mean, I can think of crazy things. But someone who's nailed to a tree, how do you even survive that, first of all? He hangs there, and his chest cavities are basically caving in on itself because when you're on that cross, you don't bleed out, you suffocate. So now, after all that torture, after all that beating, Jesus is trying to hang himself and hold up his own weight on that cross. Having been beaten, within an inch of his life. Couldn't even carry his own cross then. On top of all this, he was pierced in the side by professional executioners who did this thing regularly. To verify his death, they pierced him with a spear on his side and blood and water rushed out to verify and confirm that he was actually dead and then, according to the swoon theory, he just woke up, stood up, hopped over to the door, moved that tomb that, I mean, moved that stone that took several men, <laughs> sorry, moved that stone that took several men, went to his apostles and to the 500 brethren convinced them that this is what resurrection looks like and this is what they had to look forward to after they died and walked around like that for nearly two months. This is such, this goes to such desperate lengths to disprove the resurrection. First of all, no one would even survive the beating 
and the nailing and the hanging up there. Excuse me, all the burps are coming out right now. On top of that, he was pierced by professional executioners who knew exactly where to pierce, right below the heart, in order to verify the death. And to cap all of this, we would still have a body. We would still have a corpse. And yet, where is it? Nowhere in history have we ever found shreds of evidence to indict or to uh, affirm or to hold up the idea that there is still a body or a corpse out there according to these theories. There would still be a body if this theory was true. And yet, the empty tomb is so well testified and so well dug through. I mean, we plan on going to a trip to Israel next year. And when we look at that tomb, I bet he's still not there. And it's because this resurrection actually did happen. Now, theory number three, the hallucination theory. This theory, uh, it, it claims that the apostles really did believe that they saw Jesus risen. However, because of the loss of their leader, because the extreme grief that they felt, they mistake uh, the, the hallucination for reality. But there, first of all, hallucinations don't happen to groups, they happen to individuals. Now, Peter and John, after the, um, after the testimony of the women, went to the tomb, and one of them gets there before the other. John hallucinates, and then Peter joins in in the hallucination, has the same exact hallucination as John does. They go back to their disciples, to the apostles, tell them about the hallucination, except Thomas isn't there, but all the other disciples hallucinate the exact same hallucination along with them. And then, eight days later, they hallucinate again, but this time Thomas is there, and Thomas now joins in on the exact <laughs> hallucination that they had. So now Jesus, uh, well, the hallucination, they go and tell it to these 500 brethren, over actually 500 brethren. I mean, I emphasize that 500 people, and all of these people have the same exact hallucination as each other, at the same exact point, at the same exact time, and the same exact details claiming that they had saw this man, Jesus, risen. Even the disciples, when they first... Where's the scripture? I should have gone to that scripture. Where's it at? No. Anyway. The disciples, when they saw Jesus resurrected, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, they saw him. And yet, the scripture says, some still doubted. That can't be Jesus. No, I saw him dead. I saw him. Yes, it is Jesus. No, it can't be. I saw him crucified and I saw him dead. It is Jesus. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Well, how do you know that? The women told me. I mean, come on now. Dr. Vody Bauckham, Dr. William Lane Craig, Dr. Frank Turek all combined these points and these evidences to point to vindicate to um exclusify the claim of christianity that our leader was the only one not buddha not muhammad not joseph smith was the only one that actually resurrected and that there's so much overwhelming evidence for that fact it is the most well attested fact in history And um, the problem with these claims as well is that the apostles and the disciples would have had to make a resurrection claim to claim that this dead man, Jesus, was resurrected. And it never dawns on the Romans and the Jews to simply open the tomb and show and prove that this man was not resurrected. It never dawns on them through the whole explosion of Christianity after the so-called resurrection to just open the tomb and look. That is also evidence that the tomb was indeed empty. And the problem with all of these as well is that, well, 
uh, I forget the name right now, but there's a cold case detective where he uh, says that, I'm paraphrasing here, he said that the, uh, the motivation for most crimes and uh, most fallacies or most um, things, <laughs> the motivation for things or the crimes is money, power, or sex. Now I have some questions to ask you. Did the disciples get ordained into power by claiming that Jesus resurrected? N no, not one bit. Did they get all the hoochies from claiming that Jesus resurrected? No. Did they get riches, money, and power by claiming Jesus resurrected? Did they get all the gold and all the silver that they wanted? The opposite. They had no power. It, of course, the power that was within them. I'm talking as uh, social s status power. They had no money, but pretty much a lot of them were really poor. And they absolutely, of course, didn't gain um, relationship with the women or <laughs> anything to that sort by claiming Jesus resurrected. In fact, they went to their deaths claiming that this man, their leader, their God, had resurrected. And it also um, goes to show that if this, all, this whole story was made up, this whole thing was fictitious, yet beaten with an olive tree branch, boiled in hot oil, beheaded, stoned, starved, none of them gave up the story. None of them caved. The cowards turned into very brave soldiers and warriors for God. Being so convinced, even James, who didn't even believe his own brother Jesus, came to God, came to believe and be a devout Christian. In fact, he would become the head of the, um, the Jerusalem church, the churches in that area, because of the truth of the resurrection. Now, uh, my one of my last points is I know I'm I'm ninety nine point nine percent positive to uh, exactly why the resurrection is so painstakingly attacked. It's so um, desperately trying to be disproven, and it's because it's a doctrine of Christianity. I want to share a story with you all. I believe it was maybe fourth, fifth, or sixth grade. I was really young, but I still remember this um, because it had a it provoked a lot of thought in me. There's a if you the it's a pretty um, tragic story and very uh, well known the Columbine High School shooting. Um, there's a movie that depicts the Columbine school shooting but surrounded by this girl named Rachel Joy Scott. And she was the first victim to die in this shooting. It was, it was such a uh, unimaginable atrocity. But this girl, uh, there's a movie about it and it's called um, I'm Not Ashamed, I believe that's what it's called. Uh, it's been a while since I watched it, but when I was in the fourth, fifth, sixth grade, the uh, the school had an assembly about the Columbine school shooting and about Rachel Joy Scott, and they completely revolved the assembly around her idea of a chain reaction, that if one person remains kind, positive, and um, loving, then that could start a chain reaction with other people, and eventually it'll spread throughout uh, the population. You know, one thing I did not learn ever from that assembly, and I had to learn it by watching the movie, was that Rachel Joy Scott was a very dedicated, very devout, and very passionate Christian. I'm not joking you. They left out everything that that girl lived for, that everything that that girl uh, wrote in her journal the most important thing that she wanted the world to know 
Legends. I completely discarded it. I never even learned about that until years and years later when I watched the movie. The the entire purpose of why she was such a, a renowned and such a, a heart a loving and a passionate, spectacular and marvelous girl was because of her faith and her devotion and her belief and rock hard solidness to the faith of her Jesus Christ. And it, it absolutely, it frustrates me that schools completely did her a, a tragic disservice by leaving out everything that she lived for. That's why, in my opinion, I believe that. Um, I mean, my brother pointed this out to me not too, not too long ago. You can practically be so protective everyone else of everyone else's beliefs, everyone else's sexual orientations, of everyone else's identity, of everyone else's religion. But when you talk about that Jesus, when you talk about that Christianity, that resurrection, that Bible with that word abomination and with that word heaven and hell and choice free will the apostles the disciples the gospels and the resurrection I mean take this from a person who's experienced this in several classrooms you will be persecuted above all the rest and that's not um of playing the victim card because as a follower of Jesus I don't have the right to play the victim but it just shows that Jesus words were true when he resurrects and he goes to be with the father the comforter is sent for a reason because we will be persecuted we will suffer tribulation and we will suffer the um the weight that it has of bearing that cross but in spite of all that the reason why the apostles and disciples went to their horrid deaths to proclaim this gospel is the entire reason why we have Christianity today. By definition, you can't be a Christian and reject the gospels and the doctrine of the resurrection. Just like being a Christian and saying you don't believe the resurrection is like saying you're a married bachelor. It's such it's such a conflict, such a paradox, it absolutely collapses on itself. Like, wait, wait. Um, I, I think I forgot to read the scripture, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to read it. I forgot to point this out before I started. Okay, here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, or 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. If there's no resurrection of the dead, what is the point of anything? Rationality and love, it's all lost. Free will, it's all lost because we're just molecular machines prancing throughout to our DNA. The resurrection is very, very vital. It's if there's no resurrection, the Christianity is like a house of cards. You pull that one card out and pff, the whole thing falls on itself. That's all I have for tonight. I know I got uh, a little bit lengthy there at the end. Uh, how much? 44 minutes. Not too bad. I should get back. I should have got back at Jose for making me do a 27 minute sermon. I should have gone two hours tonight, but I'm not going to do that to you guys. <laughs> Any questions before I close out here? Any questions? I'm going to wait for the comments to come in because they do come in late and I don't want to close out the video while someone has a question unanswered. But don't forget, too, that you can um, message us, message the uh, Hope City page with questions or prayer requests. No questions? It's completely fine if you have a question. Can you read the scriptures you went over in the beginning? Okay. 
they're fairly simple. It's that traditional creed that Paul was handed down to that Paul didn't get himself. He didn't uh, gain it by his own imagination. This was handed to him all the way down from within the first five years of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 through, through 8. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So he makes, he says, this is of first importance that I received this. It's not mine. Where did I left off? Okay. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again in the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of cephas meaning peter then of the 12 after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are flown <clears throat> excuse me but some are flown asleep after that he was seen of james then of all the apostles and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time so this creed, this traditional creed, this message here that he appeared to all these people, died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures, goes back all the way to early. And this is another thing that historians look for. If there is early independent sources outside of the text itself that um, verify the events and that at least one of them is early, then it's much more likely that this is a historical fact. And this goes all the way back to the within the first five years of the resurrection. Please read up what I wrote and let me know if you remember that part. Oh, here we go. Didn't one of the guys ask her, did you believe in God? And she said yes, and then they shot her and something to that effect. Where is your God now? Yeah, that's what happened in the, in the movie. I haven't, uh, I don't know if that was a true detail. I'm not sure. But yeah, that is what happened um, in the movie, is that they uh, the shooters asked her, do you believe in your God after they shot her? And while she was being bled out, bled, <laughs> bled out to death, um, they said, go be with your God. And then they shot her even more. Yeah, oral history, the, it was passed on. These exact words, this exact tradition, this exact creed was passed on all the way through the apostles, all the way down to Paul, to the Church of Corinthian. Uh, any more questions? I'm down to stay however long, <laughs> if you guys got more questions. I guess no more questions? All right, I guess there's no more questions, so I'll just close this out in prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for the study. Thank you for the resurrected Son that you so in whom you are well pleased that this was actually the Son, the second person of the Trinity that you were so well pleased in, and your stamp of approval was given to him on that third day of the resurrection. God, we thank you for the foundation of our faith, that it is founded in fact, in historical uh, reasoning and rationality that your son, our Jesus Christ, did indeed rise by our faith. This is not blind faith. We love you, God, so much. We thank you for the certainty that we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. I pray for the, uh, the blessing, the salvation, the guidance, and the sanctification of all who are watching and all those around the world. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you all have a good week.